and welcome to this general election debate for Congressional District 6. This debate is sponsored by Clean Elections, the state's nonpartisan voter education agency. My name is Danielle Lerner and I'll be moderating today's debate. And the way we're sharing this debate is part of a brand new effort to support democracy in Arizona. Thanks to a partnership with the Clean Elections Commission, the Arizona Media Association and Bitfire Studios, we are working to make sure these 2024 debates are the most accessible in Arizona history. That means this debate will air on a long list of local TV stations, radio stations and digital platforms, including support from local newspapers. And we have tried to keep the rules pretty simple here. Each candidate will have two minutes to make an opening statement and then one minute for a closing statement. Candidates have drawn straws to determine the order. Now, throughout the debate, I will pose questions to each candidate, allow them to answer, and then make sure the other candidate has a chance to respond. Whenever a question is directed to a specific candidate, only that candidate's microphone will be open. At all other times, every microphone will be open. Uh, thank you to the voters across Arizona who have submitted questions for this debate. No candidate has been given advanced access to any of these questions. And so with that, let's introduce our candidates for this debate. Republican incumbent Juan Siscomani and Democratic challenger Kirsten Engel. Uh, Mr. Siscomani, you have the first opening statement. You have two minutes. Well, thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much. Thanks to the Clean Elections for hosting this debate as well. Thank you for all the people at home. And I know that this is also being transmitted in Spanish. Quiero saludar a la gente en casa. Muchas gracias por estar aquí y por su atención a la nación y el futuro que tenemos también. I'm uh, proud to serve the district where I grew up. The district also where my wife and I, Laura, are raising our six kids. And you may know my story, but I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. I'm a proud immigrant, immigrated to the United States when I was 11 years old, became a U.S. citizen in 2006. Then I was elected to Congress 16 years later in 2022. Nowhere else in the world would I have this opportunity. So I believe in the American dream. I, I am committed to defending that American dream, but it saddens me that that American dream seems out of reach to so many people now. Listen, Washington is broken. It's completely disconnected from the reality that you and I live in our homes today. I know that because of all the people that I talked to back at home, from community leaders all the way to the parents of the kids that I coach as well. That's the reality that we're living right now. Now, politicians are trying to tell us that things are okay. How come, though, prices are still too high? How come the border is still in chaos? How come our veterans are still struggling with mental health issues and also homelessness? The reason is that the extremes have, frankly, taken over. Partisanship has taken over, but I don't uh, subscribe to that. My approach has always been to bring results and to work with both sides. That's why I was ranked the most bipartisan member of Congress from Arizona. That's also why, as an appropriator, I've been able to secure resources to come back home so that we can fund police, fire, hospitals, so that we can invest in roads and water infrastructure. These are the things that matter. So today, I look forward to debating and being able to contrast and compare what I stand for and what my opponent stands for. Right. Kirsten Engel believes in uh, increasing taxes, Thank you, Mr. defunding the police, was, and then not accepting the border crisis. That was so your, we'll see those differences here tonight. That was your two-minute opening statement. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Engel. You have two minutes. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, tonight, uh, Representative Siskamani and I stand as opponents on this debate stage. Uh, but I'd like to acknowledge that last night, uh, I was proud to stand with you as a fellow Tucsonan as we commemorated the tragedy of October 7th, a year ago today. And I want to thank Clean Elections for delaying this debate so that we could attend that event. Now let's get to that debate. I'm Kirsten Engel, and I'm honored to be running to represent Southern Arizona in Congress. It was truly a dream come true to move to Arizona 20 years ago with our then infant daughter to teach at the University of Arizona. Go Cats! And I'm proud to call Arizona my home. I first ran for office as a mom, fighting for funding for our schools. Elected three times to our Arizona legislature, I fought for the freedom of women to make their own reproductive health care decisions, to fight to lower prices, to secure our water future, and to work as a bipartisan basis for a thriving economy. Now I'm running for Congress. I think uh, Representative Siskamani and I 
agree that Congress has been run by extremists. It has been the most dysfunctional Congress in modern history. Congress has not been able to pass a budget, much less pave our roads or protect our troops. Where we disagree is, I believe, Mr. Siskamani is part of that dysfunction. He has sided with the extremists over and over again to raise costs, to restrict abortion access, and even to reject a bipartisan border deal to secure the border. I have a 19-year-old daughter and an 88-year-old father. I'm running to restore her freedoms and to protect Social Security and Medicare for him. Not just for them, but for all Arizonans. All right, thank Ms. you for tuning in. Ms. Engel, thank you. That was two minutes. Uh, we have a lot of issues uh, to get to in this next hour, but uh, since we have you both here, I'd like to start with uh, current events. And given what's happening right now in Israel and Lebanon, I'd like to quickly touch on foreign relations. Uh, yesterday, of course, marked one year since Hamas's initial attack on Israel. And so uh, what is the U.S.'s role in fostering peace within this region? Mr. Siskamani, we'll start with you. It's a very important question. And thanks for starting with that, especially given the date that we have, the one-year anniversary that just passed. Uh, I was in Israel in April, uh, six months after the attacks of October 7th. And I got to visit the sites where this happened, especially in the southern part of Israel. Visited with the families, heard from them, the families of the hostages as well. We went all the way up north where the new battle has also started there. Israel is under attack. Uh, from all fronts at this point. At that time, they had only seen the attacks from the south, uh, expecting the attacks from the north as well. That has, the situation has gotten worse. The weekend after we came back from Israel, that weekend Iran launched an attack, a rocket attack on Israel, and they were able to protect themselves with the Iron Dome that is, that is uh, produced right here in, uh, in, uh, with Raytheon in our district. So that alone shows the importance of the U.S. relationship with Israel and the partnership that we must continue to foster, invest in, and support between Israel and the United States. They're our greatest ally in the Middle East, the only democracy that we can count on in that region. So we need to be supportive of their efforts, and they have the right to defend themselves against all terrorism, uh, all these Iran-funded terrorist groups from the north, from the, from the West and from the South that Israel is being threatened, they have the right to defend themselves. And it's our duty as, uh, uh, as their partners and friends to stand by them all every step of the way. And I'm proud to have been a part of that. I'm part of the Appropriations Committee where we fund the international efforts and the state and foreign operations. And we've been able to, um, to allocate more resources so that Israel has those tools to defend itself. Ms. Engel, your response to that same question. Well, the escalation of uh, military conflict in the Middle East is uh, truly concerning. It's, it's the, it, it keeps me up at night. And this follows on from, you know, the latest that we're seeing follows on from that terrible attack on October 7th. Uh, and the loss of life uh, was absolutely uh, horrible. Israel, absolutely has a right to defend itself, and how it does so matters. Uh, we have also seen tremendous loss of life of the Palestinians, um, and that has also been very hard to witness. Uh, our role has to be to bring a negotiated ceasefire that will bring the hostages home. There are still many hostages in uh, in Gaza. Many of them are Americans. Um, we have to make sure that there are clear objectives for, uh, for the future here, and how are we going to bring this to peace. We need to make sure that we have a plan for self-determination for the Palestinians and that we return to a two-state solution. Israel is one of our greatest allies. We have to continue to support Israel, and I support that. Supporting Israel is also supporting peace in the Middle East, and that will happen when we are able to come to a two-state solution. 
okay, sticking with the issue of security, but bringing it uh, just a little closer to home with what's happening at the U.S.-Mexico border currently. Uh, the 2024 voters' agenda shows that 89 percent of voters who were surveyed uh, feel that immigration reform is important to our economy, that we need to prioritize creating a functioning border for commerce and immigration. Uh, also, 82 percent see it as a humanitarian and refugee crisis, and they want leaders to work together to find a bipartisan solution to this issue. Uh, so, Mr. Siskamani, you have said that you would have been open to amending that bipartisan border bill had it made it to the House. Uh, you mentioned you took issue with uh, the bill's threshold of Border Patrol migrant encounters, saying that it was too high. Um, and, Ms. Engel, you've been um, outspoken and critical of the Senate Republicans voting down that bipartisan border security bill. So, with all of that said, moving forward, what are some actionable steps um, that you can take to help improve the border situation in a bipartisan way? Ms. Engel, we'll start with you on this one. Well, this is a absolutely a top issue, and I have always said that we need to secure the border and that neither party has done a good job of this. You know, President Trump famously separated families at the border, put kids in cages, and President Biden, let's be real, he was late to see what a crisis it was becoming. We need to secure the border. We had the opportunity to do so. The bipartisan border security deal that was backed by the Border Patrol Union that would have put more boots on the ground, would have put in fentanyl detection system at our ports of entry, would have hired thousands of more asylum officers and judges. It was a true bipartisan deal that would have pushed us way ahead in dealing with this problem at the border. But my opponent opposed it, rejected it out of hand just days after President Trump made it very clear that he wanted to keep the border a crisis so that he could run on it for his presidential campaign. My concern, my beef with our current representative is that he is not committed to solutions on the border. He's committed to politics. And we are tired of that. We cannot afford more months of politicking on the border. We need solutions. That was a solution. And I think that that's a really good place for us to start, because we know we have to secure the border first, and then we need to fix our very broken immigration system. Mr. Tiscomani, your response. That was two minutes of no solutions. You asked for solutions going forward after this bill, and I didn't hear any. That's because there aren't any on that side. Now, when Kirsten Engel says that Joe Biden was late to this uh, to, to this issue, just a little while ago, she, when she was asked if there was a border crisis, an immigration crisis, she straight up said no. So. I think she's right in line with what the Biden administration has done on this issue. Now, when you look at the border, you got to look at all the issues on the border. Immigration, which I have a personal journey with, it's the process, it's slow, it's bureaucratic, it's expensive, it takes way too long. 13 years it took my family to be able to achieve American citizenship. And then you've got trade and commerce. For, for Arizona, Mexico is our number one trading partner. We heavily depend on that trade and commerce. And then, of course, you have the security issue. It's security in the sense of fentanyl, but also the human trafficking of the lives that are lost of the kids that are trafficked, of the 85,000 plus children that have been lost by the federal government that are in this country that they cannot track down. That is a real crisis. How Kirsten Engel doesn't think it's a crisis, it's beyond me. So what do we need to do? We need to find solutions that work. This bipartisan border package had a broader bipartisan opposition to it, which is why it didn't pass a Democrat-controlled Senate. Even representatives like Raul Grijalva, my neighbor, the, your representative, actually, the district that you live in, Kirsten, he came out against that bill, even with a statement before the one that I sent out. I stand by what I said of what were the issues. I wish we would have been able to work on it. But what do we need to do? We need to implement again, remain in Mexico. We need to make sure that we tackle this issue piece by piece, because this big idea of a huge border package is going to find problems. Now, we can't wait for that to work and not do anything. We have to work on that big package at the same time that we can continue to keep on uh, getting rid of catch and release, ending the parole authority, uh, increase the uh, asylum uh, uh, credibility of fear, and remain in Mexico. And of course, we have to finish the gaps on the wall. There are specific things that we can and should do right now. And Ms. Engel, as far as responding to that, is there yes. a better strategy than just a one-size kind of fits-all border security bill that lumps all of that in there? 
Well, look, we have a very uh, closely divided government. Uh, and this was a bipartisan deal, and it was actually a very conservative one. Uh, it was endorsed by the Border Patrol Union. It had been negotiated by one of the most conservative senators in the Senate, Lankford. Also, Arizona's own independent senator, Kirsten Sinema, and a Democrat. This was a bill that would have pushed us forward in a really significant way on an issue that we know has been very divisive. It's been very divisive nationally and here in Arizona. And we know when you talk about things like trade, that is so important. Mexico is our biggest trading partner. partner. But when I talk to people uh, here in our community, they all say that Southern Arizona is given a bad rap because of the border. You had a chance to embrace a bipartisan deal that would have made significant step forward, and you rejected it. And you rejected it because of President Trump telling you and your caucus to do so. And the deal then fell apart. We need to elect people that will embrace solutions and no longer this politics. We keep on electing people that go down to the border, take photo ops, but aren't willing to do the job in D.C. of actually solving the border crisis. So that's what I'll do. That's what I did in the Arizona legislature as I worked, worked across the aisle on some of our biggest issues from water to education to public safety. And I will do so on the issue of the border. Immigration is very personal to me. I went through this journey. I know the, the pits and the falls and where we need to be improving this. And for someone that was in the state legislature, actually, you've been an elected official longer than I have, five years in the legislature, and, and not much to show for. Kirsten, when you look at you board, voting against the border strike force, that was a clear example of where you stand on the border. Listen, when we talk about this bill or any other effort, we have to make sure that it has a wide bipartisan support. The fact that you can get a few people on each side of the aisle, a small number, to like something doesn't mean that it has broad, broad bipartisan support. And, 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 and you know, we're, I'm going to say this now before we continue. You really need to uh, temper the lies on this, on this stage and, and where, on the airwaves. Trump never called me. No one called me to tell me how to vote. I know how to do that by myself, and I know how to read bills. And what I read on that were several aspects of it that needed work. It wasn't ready to be passed. Now, I had no authority over that as a House member. All I could do was give my thoughts on it, and where, as a legislator, I saw that going, which is what I did. The Senate, Dem controlled by the Democrats, was not able to pass that bill out of the Senate. So we actually never got a chance to work on it. That's the reality of that bill. The fact that you want to, you know, exaggerate that and, and put more power even that I could ever uh, 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 seem to have to be able to kill a bill, that, that's almost humorous. But what we have to look is at our records here, our records on actually standing uh, by our law enforcement. You want to talk about the Border Patrol Council? They've endorsed me in this race. Law enforcement organizations have done the same. Nine of them. None have endorsed Kirsten Engel. Why? Because they know who stands by them. I believe in border security, but I also believe in an immigration reform. Being pro-border security doesn't mean that we're, that we're anti-immigrant. That's, that's something that we need to get very straight here. I am an immigrant. I am proud of it. And I'm also pro-border security and pro-trade, given that I led the Arizona-Mexico Commission for eight years under Governor Ducey to enhance that trade, and that was a big priority for me. One more question on this, and then we'll move on to some of our other issues. Um, if elected, would you work Work to try to get that border security bill in a spot where it could pass, or is it time to look for a new strategy? Absolutely, I would work on that because we know that it had in it the components that we need. Look, one of the issues that we all know about at our southern border has been that there is a very large number of migrants that have come to claim asylum. And that that has been a distraction for our Border Patrol agents, who we need to be securing the border, stopping the flow of fentanyl into the United States. Half of the fentanyl that comes into the United States comes across Arizona's border. We also have a problem with human smuggling. What that border deal would have done is put more boots on the ground. It would have hired thousands more asylum officers, a hundred more immigration judges, and it would have made sure that we had the technology 
to scan every truck coming across the border that had fentanyl in it, not just as we have now, one in 20. So right now, we don't have those resources. We don't have those immigration judges. We don't have that scanning technology. We are back basically to ground zero. And yet those were the components that we need. And that is what I would work on. Not photo ops, not words, but actual actions. This is our elected representative, and I don't think he has much to show for himself in terms of the issue that he has been talking about for years. It's time for change. Now, you both mentioned the border and Mexico as incredibly important to Arizona's economy. So let's switch gears to the can, can economy. Can I uh, from, uh, add on that? Uh, so she had a few seconds. turns on this, and yep. the last time she spoke were two minutes. So I, I, if I can 30 have second a response. part of that. Yep. Uh, you know, th this is the, the, the issue. Uh, I mean, most of the time that, that Kirsten Engel spoke about this was about the, that bill. That, that bill died because it couldn't garner enough support on the Senate side. We're running for, for House seats here, me for a re-election and her for uh, a, an attempted uh, election on this seat. We have to look at what the House can offer. I'll tell you what I've done. I passed a bipartisan bill on border security that dealt specifically with high-speed chases because that's a big issue for Cochise County. Now, who voted for this? Every Republican voted for this, Danielle, okay. and also 56 Democrats voted for this. That's 30 it went seconds, over to the Senate, so we are, and it did not, to have it to did move not on pass to there. Issue. It did not even got, got seen there. Thank so you, we Mr. passed Siscomani. bipartisan support. We can revisit that and, if we have and, time later. I just want to make well, sure that we get to enough issues. I just want to set the record straight and make sure that we have enough time to answer the hour. questions. I understand. Thank you. Let's, let's discuss the economy at this point. Another big issue um, in this district, and we want to make sure the voters here, uh, your state on that. A recent survey from the Pew Research Center uh, actually put the economy as the top issue for voters in this election. 81 percent of registered voters putting that at the top. Uh, inflation's back to its lowest level since February of 2021, but Arizonans are still feeling the pinch in some of those everyday costs, the grocery store, paying rent. They're making tough choices. Uh, so what steps will you take as a member of Congress to provide the average consumer with some tangible relief? Mr. Siskamani, we can start with you on this. Sure. This is the issue that we that I hear about the most. No question about it. Wherever I go, um, it, whether it's uh, discussing with uh, community leaders, with with mayors, with elected officials, with parents. I'm a flag football coach, so I get an opportunity to be on the field with, with quite frankly, parents and adults that that will never go to a political meeting or even a a chamber event. These are people just going to work, taking their kids to play sports, and and that's who I also talk to a lot. And dropping kids off at school, both from kindergarten all the way to high school, that I that I have. So I have an opportunity to talk to a lot of people, a lot of parents, and this is the number one issue, the cost of living, how expensive things are, that they have to tighten the belt while the federal government continues to spend in a reckless way. I'm an appropriator. So at the, as the only freshman in the Appropriations Committee uh, from Arizona and the House side, and the only freshman in Congress uh, appointed at the beginning of, of this term, uh, you know, I have a seat at the table to make sure that we get our fiscal house in order. We have to stop spending money the way that the federal government has been spending money. People at home have tightened their belts. They have reduced their spending because of the inflation that the Joe Biden administration has brought in and one that Kirsten Lingle approves and supports. We cannot continue on that path. We cannot continue on that road. Families are hurting. So we need to reduce the spending from the government. We need to reduce the regulatory environment so that the businesses can go and create these jobs. We need to make sure that we're promoting them by expanding expanding the economy and spending less money on the government side. That's what I've been focusing on as an appropriator and the resources that I've been able to bring back home through the community funding project have enhanced the economic development like new roads, like in our hospitals, JTED, for example, the land for a new building that I, that I helped fund with the, with the funds that we brought back from the Appropriations Committee. These are targeted investments that help with the economic development and the workforce needs as well. Ms. Engel, how do we get Arizona in some relief? Well, they really need relief. Um, high costs are really digging into family budgets. And it's a real issue for families. It's an issue for seniors. It's, it's an issue for people who are working minimum wage jobs. Um, and they need and deserve relief. Um, 
I have been an advocate working on lowering costs for families here in Arizona. You know, when I was in the Arizona legislature, I introduced a bill to go after price gougers, to give our attorney general the authority that the attorney general in 36 other states has to go after companies that are jacking up prices of, a, of essential items during an emergency. Um, this is the kind of authority that we need even on the national level. Um, we need to make sure that we are not letting companies get away with things like fixing prices for rental homes. Affordable housing is also part of those very high costs that people are struggling with. And, you know, price fixing by algorithm is still price fixing. We have to make sure that we're going after landlords or companies, large equity firms that are coming into our housing market to make sure that doesn't happen. And we can do a lot on the federal level to lower costs for families, such as promoting and expanding the authority that Medicare now has as a result of a bill passed by Congress earlier, before Juan Siscomani was in office, that allows Medicare to negotiate the price of prescription drugs. This is going to lower those costs of something that takes a big chunk out of their budget. That same law that, by the way, my opponent actually opposes, actually caps the cost of insulin and caps the cost for health care. Those are the kinds of things, using the power of the federal government, we can reduce costs for families. I haven't seen that from my opponent. He's even done things like cut, uh, vote to cut things okay, like affordable housing money on the federal level. That's two minutes. Thank you. Mr. Siscomani, your response to that? <laughs> that's a complete lie. I, I really, I, I would like to one day just ask you for the sources of, of 90 percent of the things that, that, that you say uh, about me. The so home that, that would be very interesting program. to see. But here's the reality. People are hurting at every level. We have, we have young students graduating college having to move back in with their parents. We have seniors on the fixed income not able to afford uh, basic necessities. Just before coming here, I met with a group of seniors in Saddlebrook where they're nervous about their, their pharmacy closing because rural pharmacies are closing. That is a big, big concern for them because of what's happening in the entire healthcare industry here. So, so when we talk about the economy, this is something that is hurting everyone. High taxes hurt everyone. High prices is a tax on pr practically everyone. And when the government overspends money, that's exactly what we're going to get. And when you want to raise taxes or actually involve more government into, into regulation, um, prices for, for anything that you're looking out there, that's exactly what's, what's wrong with that approach of having more government instead of more of the private sector competition to make sure that that draws, that, uh, that draws prices down. So when it comes to government spending then, how do you feel those funds should be managed or spent? So, for example, we have clean energy tax credits uh, that were part of the, uh, the IRA that, that I, I wrote a letter along with 17 other Republicans that we said we should be protecting these clean energy tax cuts. These are things that we can do. Uh, again, we have to lower the regulation on businesses. When businesses are having to hire full-time people, Danielle, to actually be able to put up with the bureaucracy that the federal government is putting them through, that's a full-time person that could be used to actually enhance their services and go and provide and grow, actually grow the, the business as well. I just talked to a group of businesses where I had a roundtable, and they said, my top line number is great, money's coming in, but the bottom one is not because of the cost of doing business. Everything is just more expensive. It's taking longer. You talk about affordable housing. There, I, I met with a group of uh, uh, people that work on this, and with less government regulation, that would free up our, our builders to be able to actually invest in this and create that affordable housing that we very much need, especially in our district. We have to be able to put in policies that help those that are in the most need and give people the freedom to go and pursue their American dream and starting a business, getting a job, pursuing an education, whatever it may be. But right now, decisions are being made if they can afford that or not. I just talked to a pastor whose kid said, I can't buy a home unless my wife is making the exact same amount of money, which is a considerable amount of money, and they're having to move back in with them. These are the kind of stories that we keep hearing, and they're very common, unfortunately, and we have to step in and actually invest in what's going to grow the economy, but more government regulation and more government rules, th that doesn't have a history of working at all. Ms. Engel, your thoughts on government spending and when it comes to regulations?
Absolutely, absolutely. And unfortunately, my opponent has used his his position on the Appropriations Committee to make to take votes that are are actually bad, that are raising costs for working families and are actually cutting those very programs that you're now saying that you're supporting. Um, you did vote to cut by 60 percent in July uh, the top affordable housing program that is putting money into Tucson that Tucson uses to distribute to affordable housing builders. We know that we need more affordable housing here in Arizona and that families are really struggling with that. Your vote to cut by 60 percent, one of the most effective programs, you know, that is not what we need. Um, Absolutely, I am together with you in terms of let's build our clean energy economy. It's very exciting. And as a result of that Inflation Reduction Act, there's a lot of private investment coming into Arizona. You know my background as an environmental attorney. I'm excited about this. But again, Representative Siskamani, one of your first votes when you were elected was H.R. 1, which cut money for clean energy. So. You, you're not consistent here in how you're using your position in Congress. It's not helping working families. It's actually cutting the programs that we need. We need to make sure that the middle class is not shouldering our tax burden. We know that we need the wealthy and the big corporations of this country to be paying their fair share, and they're not right now. We need to close those loopholes. Uh, we need to pass a child tax credit. That will really help our working families. We need to, to cut the taxes for the middle class and not support things like the Trump tax cuts, which is a handout to the wealthy. Thank you, Ms. Engel. Mr. Siskamani, would sure. you like to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, when you look at H.R. 1, the, uh, the only thing that H.R. 1 cut were regulations and more government interference to allow the market to take off, to be able to produce more clean energy here domestically. That, that was the main purpose of H.R. 1, and that's what that supported. But then when you look at it, housing, for example, and you, and, and you talk about education, one of the projects that I use my position in the appropriate committee to be able to support is teacher housing over in Casa Grande. Why? Because the school district there is having a very hard time attracting teachers. Matter of fact, if you go and talk to them, they'll tell you that a good number of the teachers that they've been able to fill the positions they need come from the Philippines. That goes back to the work visa issue that we need to be focusing on on the, on the border immigration side of things. We need worker visas in order to impact the economy and our workforce as well. But how do I use my position in the Appropriations Committee to, one, be able to have an force and, and apply fiscal responsibility, but also to bring the proper resources back to the district that belong here with these dollars to invest in housing, for example, for our teachers. So I've used my position wisely, and I've used it strategically to be able to benefit those in the most need, starting with our teachers as well. You mentioned resources there, so I want to transition into water. Of course, a crucial resource, particularly in this district, given its unique demographics. You've got urban growth and development. You've got farmers in places like Wilcox um, and some of the five counties that this district covers. Uh, certainly particular, a particular concern here. So how do you plan to balance water conservation efforts with the states and really this district in particular, uh, this district's economic and population growth? Mr. Siskamani, we'll start with you. Well, when you look at water, uh, th that is the, the live stream of this state. And that is, has always been th our most precious resource. And, and Arizona is very good at managing water. Uh, this is one of the issues that historically we've been able to work across party lines to be able to come around this issue, understanding that without this we wouldn't be able to exist, certainly not the way we do. We wouldn't be able to build the fifth largest city in the nation in the middle of the desert where we're sitting in right now if we wouldn't know how to manage water. Now, one of the unique things about water is there are the, are the multiple interests around it. Specifically in our district, you have ag, you have farming, you have uh, urban areas, you have mining, of course, you have rural Arizona, you have areas that are more populated like in Pima County. These all, these all have different um, uh, priorities and, and interest in, in our water resources. So we have to continue 
continue to make sure that we are efficient on it and add the complexity in Arizona that we have with the international boundary uh, with Mexico as we share water rights with them as well, as does Texas. So these are all intricacies that Arizona has been able to manage very well. I am the co-chair of the bipartisan Colorado River Caucus with a member from Colorado, the Democrat leading that committee on, on their side, where we talk about these issues. Now, with the Colorado River negotiations coming up next year, we need to be make sure that we're at the table, and that's where I am on these conversations. I just uh, introduced the bill with the largest water agreement in the history of the country between the Navajo Nation, the Hopis, and the San Juan uh, uh, tribes in order to come to an agreement, give them certainty in these rights, something that was approved, and it was signed off by the Farm Bureau, by, by the Ag community, by, by everyone involved in this, including the tribes. It was a perfect timing to be able to do this, and I've been happy to lead on this issue. This is the issue that we need to be focusing on right now. And Ms. Engel, what policies would you support, would you implement to better protect our groundwater and secure that long-term water supply? Well, we, in everything we do with respect to water, we have to be guided by the principle here in this desert state of Arizona water for Arizonans, because we know how precious a resource it is. It is vital to life. It is vital to our economy. Um, and we know that we have a water crisis. We have a drought conditions on the Colorado River, which is responsible for 40 percent of our water. I worked in the Arizona legislature on the Colorado drought contingency plan, and it was because of me that we had several million dollars going towards conservation in that drought contingency bill. But we also know that our groundwater is also under threat. Uh, I held a water town hall uh, in Pierce, Arizona, on Saturday afternoon. A whole bunch of folks came in, farmers, uh, townspeople, small business owners, and all talked about the crisis of their water, that they have lost access to their water. They've had to spend thousands of dollars to deepen their wells, and that is because we have not adequately managed our water here in Arizona. We haven't done a good job of it, and they have industrial, ag out-of-state industrial agriculture that has come in and is pumping our water dry. And we know that under the Ducey administration that my opponent worked in for years, they made sweetheart deals with the Saudi Arabians to come over here and pump our groundwater dry so that they can plant alfalfa and ship that alfalfa back to dry Saudi Arabia. That is not good management. That isn't fair for Arizona. It's not Arizona water for Arizonans, the principle that needs to guide what we're doing. There is so much that we can do, however. Uh, we need to make sure that we are supporting our farms and our ranches to make sure that we're using water the most efficiently with conservation. We can help our homeowners, our developers Thank you, to use water much more efficiently. Thank you for I that I want to response. use my experience as an environmental attorney to do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Siskamani, I'm curious, what is your stance on leasing state land to overseas uh, companies? Is that something that you would support in the future? Absolutely not. We, we Arizona water needs to be for Arizonans, and so does our land. When you have other nations coming in, especially adversary nations like China, buying up farmland like they do in Latin America, that's a that's a huge danger and a huge issue. And I absolutely don't support that. And again, th these are th th these are just stretches that Kirsten Lingle keeps bringing up. What we need to make sure is that we apply innovation here. When I met with the Safford uh, uh, farmers there, and they and they implemented this drip irrigation that is saving a huge amount of water. Water for them, and they can use over that 40% saving into another piece of land that they have as well. That produces more ag, and it also conserves our water. The mining community that I, the, every time I visit the mines, I am impressed by the way they're recycling water there as well. And the other area that I've been able to, again, I keep going back to this, why it's so important to be in the Appropriations Committee. I've been able to fund a few projects, and I'm going to list them uh, just real quick in terms of where money for water projects has gone. From PFAS in, in Pima County, that is so important 
partnering with the city of Tucson and DM Air Force Base to uh, 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 irrigation systems as well. 1.2 million for Graham County, 1.75 for Tucson, 1.75 for Marana, and uh, 2.25 for the Marana Airport as well. 990,000 for Tombstone on this year's budget that we're going to pass when we get back uh, to Washington. These are the investments that I made in water using my position again in the Appropriations Committee to make sure that water issues are being prioritized here in our district at every level. It's got to be at every level. That's why the Farm Bureau has endorsed me. They trust what I'm what I'm pushing for here. I just met with them again, the whole group, the national group actually, and th they stress the importance of this. They celebrated the uh, the water agreement that I mentioned earlier with the tribes, and they also, of course, are happy with the way we've been uh, representing farming industry. Also, along is balancing it with all the interests as well around the district. Ms. Angle, 30 seconds real quick to respond to that. Real quick, um, I would say that I'm glad to hear that my opponent agrees with me that the principle guiding us should be Arizona water for Arizonans. But unfortunately, that has not guided his past decision. It certainly hasn't guided the administration that he was a part of. Um, on his watch in that administration, the Ducey administration made a sweetheart deal with uh, the state of Arizona to come in here because we are wide open and unregulated That's and pump seconds, our aquifers Angle. dry. We need to stop Thank that, you for that and response. manage our water. Mr. Siscomani, 30 seconds. Real quick, final response before we move on to another <laughs> no, issue. I, I just find it humorous. Uh, I think, Kirsten, you're, you're giving me a lot of credit. You know, and so, so in your book, I, I killed a bipartisan deal all by myself. Also, in, in your theory, I was able to shepherd this deal with uh, with Saudi Arabia for water when uh, I was with the Ducey administration. I'm not sure how many hats you think I was wearing during that time. For the Ducey administration, I managed the Arizona-Mexico Commission, our southern Arizona relationships among the seven counties in the south. That was my responsibility there. I'm proud of the work that I did there. And that was clear in what I think of foreign nations owning our or any land or water rights that we have. All so right, thank you I, I that ask that I get judged response. by what I do, not by we what do others do. We do need to move on, however. We're, this time's going quick, so I want to make sure we get as many issues in as possible. Uh, now to an issue not just important here in Arizona, but across the entire nation. Uh, Arizonans will have a chance to vote on abortion access next month. Uh, should this issue stay in the state's hands or does it belong at the federal level? Ms. Engel, we'll start with you. This is a, a top issue. When I go from door to door and I talk to people, um, you know, they, uh, they are really, really upset. Um, here in Arizona, we almost had an 1864 criminal abortion ban go into effect. Every woman, every person has to have the freedom to make their own health care decisions with their doctor, you know, with their family. And that is not what we have. Um, when I go to Congress, I'm going to fight to protect reproductive health care. Um, I'm going to fight to restore the rights that we as women had for the past 50 years in Roe versus Wade. My opponent has shown us where he is on this issue. We cannot trust him to protect our reproductive rights. He cheered the repeal of Roe versus Wade. He's voted in Congress repeatedly to restrict women's reproductive rights. He's voted to, to restrict access to FDA-approved medication abortion very, very vital to women in our rural areas, our Hispanic and Latino women. He has voted to restrict reproductive health care for our active service duty members. And imagine that. <laughs> These are women that are fighting for our freedom, and we can't give them the freedom to make their own health care decisions? I find that outrageous. My opponent has been extreme on this. And Perhaps that shouldn't surprise us. You know, for years, he was a board member of a Christian nationalist far-right organization, the Patriot Academy, that's very clear about its views. It rejects the separation of church and state. It believes in banning abortion entirely. Um, and this is what he comes from. He was part of this organization for 14 years until he ran for Congress. Okay, thank you. That two-minute time is up. Mr. Siskamani, your stance on if abortion should be a state or federal issue? Well, I'll answer your question directly. This is a state issue. It's absolutely a state issue. I've always said it, it is a state issue, and then the Supreme Court agreed with that and put it back on the states. 
And listen, this is going to be a very personal issue. This is a very personal issue for a lot of people. And, and there's, there, there's absolutely, uh, that is exactly how the situation is. I, I trust women. I, I cherish new life. I reject the extremes on this issue. And I've been very clear, Danielle, of where I stand on it. I reject the federal ban on abortion. I support the exceptions for rape, for instance, of course, for the life of the mother. I support access to IVF so that those that want to grow their families are able to do so. This is an issue, again, that voters will decide on in November. We're going to respect the will of the voters on this issue. And it's going to be a state decision, like we've seen it all across the country. That's, again, the position that I've, that I've stood on for a long time since we started talking about this, and also the decision that the Supreme Court came down with. And that's what we're, that's what we're uh, living with, and that's what we're going to abide to, whatever the decision is when it comes November. So, Ms. Ms. Engel, just to clarify, do you support any type of ban or limits on abortion? This is a health care decision. It is a personal decision of the woman and her doctor. And unfortunately, what we've seen is there are complications from pregnancy. Um, there's no timetable. Bad preg pregnancies can go bad at any point. Um, wanted pregnancies, and we have seen just devastating horrible situations where women have lost their lives. Two women in Georgia that we've been reading about, Nicole Thurman, Candy Miller. Georgia had more exceptions than the state of Arizona. It had an exception to protect the life of the mother, but it didn't save their lives. They did not get the life-saving care. They had complications. I'm a woman. I've had complications. I've had miscarriages. This is not something that we leave to politicians. Last time I checked, Juan, you're not a doctor. I don't trust you with my health care. I'm sorry. I don't trust you with my daughter's health care. Um, we need to leave this to women and their doctors. It's too important. Women are dying as a result of this lack of health care. It's not something that we put in a lens of this week or that week. We leave this to the woman and her doctor. Mr. Siskamani, one minute to respond to that before we move on. Still no answer on if there should be any limits on this. And that's part of the problem, because I've been very clear, and I just stated it here again, exactly what my position is on the issue. However, when Kirsten Engel talks about this, she uses these examples that are tragic stories that nobody likes to hear, including her own personal one that, that I, I, I obviously uh, feel for, and we don't want to see anybody go through any of that. However, we need to be clear on this issue, and we need to stand exactly where we stand and, and define exactly where we stand on this. I was very also upfront about my uh, criticism of the 1860, uh, the, the decision that came down by, by the court in the 1864 uh, law. I, I completely opposed it because it didn't include, obviously, the exceptions that we needed. And it was a, a, a something that was bringing us back to 150 years ago, not where we are today, obviously. So I've been very upfront and open about this issue. And, and I've, I've talked about this now. Who can you not trust? Someone that is not clear on the answers on the questions that you're providing here today. Okay, like so here's an angle. One last chance to respond. Do you support any sort of term limit when it comes to abortion? The, that is the wrong lens. This is this is health care. There aren't timetables for the complications of pregnancy. We have to make sure that doctors are able to do what we ask doctors to do, which is to save lives. We know that these exceptions don't work. There are exceptions, 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 even exceptions for the life of the mother, and that will not necessarily save the mother because doctors may not give them their care, as we've seen over and over again. Okay, our time is running short, so I want to make sure you both uh, mentioned Social Security and Medicare uh, throughout this conversation, so I want to make sure we touch on that. Uh, those are often lifelines for seniors, um, especially important in this particular district. Uh, should these programs be protected? And if so, how do you not only keep these programs afloat, but also strengthen them uh, for the future? Mr. Siskamani, if you'd like to start. Absolutely. We, we can have cuts or changes on these programs. These programs need to be protected, and they need to be be solvent also 
for to protect it for our seniors. That's the priority that I have. That's what we need to do. When the government acts recklessly and it starts overspending money and, and changes on other priorities, that of course impacts uh, the, the, the solvency and it makes a lot of our seniors nervous and also those that plan to retire one day, which is quite frankly, everyone. So we need to make sure that we protect Medicare, that we protect Social Security for those that depend on that today, for all those that have paid their way into it, that they have uh, uh, that they have what they receive and what uh, I'm sorry, they have what they earned on this. It's, it's th these are their resources and we cannot be fooling around with that and endangering this issue and making them nervous. When Kirsten Engel attacks on the on the old and tired talking point from the left that Republicans want to cut Social Security and want to cut Medicare, these are the kind of things that make our seniors very nervous because they don't want to see that. Now, have there been plans out there, even from my own side of the aisle, presented on this issue? There have been, and I've come out against them because I am not one that is going to just subscribe to whatever the party line says. I don't take direction from anyone in Washington. I take direction from the people in my district. That's why I've been able to stand up against some of these plans that have uh, suggested any kind of reduction or change on these programs that would endanger our uh, seniors' benefits, both in Social Security and Medicare. So, again, I ask that I be uh, judged on what I have put forward and the activities and actions that I've put forward on this. And let me say again, no cuts, no changes to this. We need to protect the programs and their solvency as well. Another point why the economy is so important, because if the government continues to spend the way they do, and the federal government, and we continue to tax and tax and tax on my opponent proposes to do more government and more government, then that actually endangers this more than anything. Thank you, Mr. Siskamani. Ms. Engel, your take on this. Yes, these are earned benefits. Uh, these Social Security and Medicare are absolutely vital to the financial security and the health of our seniors. My dad is 88. Um, I have coffee with him every morning on his porch. I know how important Medicare is to him and his conditions. Social Security is important to him as well. And these are not government handouts. These are earned benefits. Take money out of every one of our paychecks. It goes to Social Security so that we will have it when we are older. But I'm sorry. Um, Juan Siskamani, you have not been a supporter of the Social Security Administration, the Veterans Administration, or Social Security benefits. You voted to cut by half a billion dollars the Social Security Administration. This is already an underfunded program. Cutting it by half a billion dollars decimates it. Um, you have been a part of a far-right organization that wants to raise the retirement age to 69. That is a big cut in benefits. You say that you stand up to these organizations, but why are you a member of it? And I'm sorry, you haven't convinced me that you are able to stand up to your party because you rejected the bipartisan border security deal when Trump said, let's trash it because we have to keep the border a crisis. So that's the problem. Uh, I, you know, you present yourself as a moderate, but you cave to the extremists in your party. The extremists are driving the dysfunction. They are scaring seniors because if they are in control, they will do these things. And I can't trust you to stop these cuts that are going to affect people like my dad. All right, Mr. Siskamani, one minute to respond before well, we Well, Kirsten, up. I'm not convincing you because I'm not trying to convince you. I'm trying to convince my constituents, those that actually live in the district. You don't live in the district, so you're not one of our constituents. But here's the reality. When we look at organizations and whatever plan they've put forward, and I publicly come out against these plans, we're on record of doing that. So let me make it clear. I am not for raising the age limit. I am not for changing it. I am not for making any kind of cuts on this. And that's exactly what has put me at odds with some of these groups that, that I guess that, that we belong to as a Republican caucus. So we debate ideas and they put the plan out there. And sometimes I agree with it. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I agree with part of it. And that's why I've been clear on it. The reality is that in Kirsten's world, you either have to be all in or all out. There's no wiggle room and there's nothing in the middle that would work. I, pr I present myself as someone that is bipartisan, but it's not just my opinion. I say again from my opening, I was ranked, not my opinion, but I was ranked 
the most bipartisan member in the Arizona delegation as a freshman, so I have a track All record right, thank you, of Mr. working Siskamani. with both sides. Daniel, thank you. Hard to believe it's time for closing statements already. So okay. each of you... Do I have time to do a quick rebuttal there? We, we, we don't have time. We're going to do closing statements. Okay. We each have one minute. Um, and again, to keep us on time, please stick to uh, that one minute. So, Mr. Siskamani, you can kick us off here. One minute. Sure. Well, I just want to say to everyone at home, thank you so much. It's been an honor to have this conversation with you today. It's been an honor to represent you this entire time. Uh, in the two years that I've been in, I'm, I'm an outsider. I'm an outsider still in Congress, and I can tell you that politicians there don't understand what we're going through. I understand our community because I grew up here. I went to school here. I graduated. I'm raising my family here. I am from here. This community welcomed me when my family and I immigrated to the United States. So I just ask you this to support, uh, to, to, I ask for your support in this election. I ask it because I want to continue to work for you. We have a vision that we cannot continue on this path. This path that has not been working for your family has not been working for my family. I can speak from experience. So I want to thank you again for the support that you gave us, the shot that you gave me at this job the last two years. And I ask for your vote to do this two more years to continue to represent your interest in Washington because the Washington politicians don't understand that. And even the local politicians don't understand that either, like my opponent, Kirsten Engel. Thank so I you, humbly Mr. ask for your Scamani. support and vote. Ms. Engel, you have one minute for your closing statement. Yes, in less than 30 days, we will have an election. Uh, I think early ballots are going out tomorrow. Um, our framers were smart people. They said that you could elect a member to the House every two years. That means if you don't like your current representative, you don't think that they are doing the best job in representing your interests in Washington, D.C., you can vote them out. And you can vote in somebody who you believe will be a better representative of your interests. I hope tonight that I've shown you that I'm on your side and I will be a better representative, an independent thinker, somebody who will fight for you in Washington, D.C. Mr. Sisamani just said that I'm, <laughs> he complimented me by saying that I'm really out for something, out for what I believe in, and that is true. I'm out for believing that you deserve your Social Security and your Medicare. I believe all that right, women thank you, Ms. Engel. We do have, have to wrap the up right our closing to make statements their own now. Care decisions. That is all the thank time you. that we have for today's debate with candidates for Congressional District 6. On behalf of our partners at Clean Elections, the Arizona Media Association, Reister, and Bitfire Studios, thanks for joining us.